we're going to be talking a little bit about today about uh, fame, famous people, uh, just a little bit. Um, and I personally have, am not, have never met anybody like truly famous, famous. The closest I ever got was when I was a freshman in college, the, the Indianapolis Colts sent a group of scouts to watch one of our practices. And, uh, and it was like super crazy because they were like in suits and Indianapolis Colts hats, which, you know, was the weirdest thing. And we had this like tower that our coaches could stand in to watch practice. So they all went up and watched the tower. They were actually watching this free safety we had who was, who was potential professional material. Um, but they uh, invited five of us to stay after practice and talk to him. I was one of the five, which was kind of cool. And so um, the other guys went first. I was the last one to go. And my conversation was, I walked up, and they were like, hey, what year are you? I said, I'm a freshman. They said, keep up the good work. And I walked away. That was the, <laughs> that was the whole conversation. Um, but I got to be one of the five that, you know, so from then on, I was one of the big shots, you know, that, yeah, the Colts talked to me. <laughs> they didn't really talk to me. They just asked what year I was and told me to keep up the good work. But, but, uh, but one of Esther's favorite stories is her sister, um, uh, Esther's mom loves um, the Eagles, and she got her, they had a cousin whose sister-in-law or something sang back up for Don Henley when he went um, uh, solo. And so um, Esther's mom got invited to a Don Henley concert with backstage passes and everything, got to meet Don Henley. And, uh, and Esther's little sister was, you know, pretty young at the time, that age when kids will say anything. And so they go backstage and, and uh, Esther's mom was like fawning over Don Henley and, and he was real polite and he bent over and said, did you like the show? She said, no, it was super boring and way too loud. And, uh, and, and Esther's mom was like mortified that, that uh, Esther's little sister like told Don Henley the truth. But, um, <laughs> But anyway, celebrity is an odd thing today. Um, and honestly, you know, over the past 20 years, it's gotten weirder in our country. You know, when I was a kid, we still had true superstars like Michael Jackson and maybe Madonna, you know, and before that, it was Elvis and the Beatles and the Rolling Stones. You know, those videos of girls like screaming and passing out when somebody walks out on stage, you know, that, that, weird, um, that weird superstar reality. Um, and what's weird is we still have fame today, but... Uh, it's and, and people still draw crowds, obviously, and we still have famous people um, whose autographs are kind of worth something. But the the strangest thing is some of the most popular and and uh, maybe um, uh, influential people on the planet are you know weird kids making videos in their mom's basement. Like YouTubers have gone like completely off the chart. I recently read a survey they did with Gen Z older Gen Z kids, you know, who are now like adults, which is weird. Um, and, it, and they showed them famous people, like everything from politicians to big thinkers to, you know, people influencing the world. And, uh, and they also showed them social media influencers. And 100% of the participants surveyed recognized almost all the social media influencers and knew almost none of the, the like truly influential people on the planet. They didn't know any of the old rock, like I think most of them knew Michael Jackson, but you know, they couldn't recognize any of the old rock stars, any of the old mo uh, movie stars. Like, but they all knew like PewDiePie or whatever from YouTube. It was, it's the the weirdest reality. So not only has social media allowed like more kind of ordinary people to reach weird levels of fame and recognition, but it's um, given us far more access to traditionally famous people. Um, the, the people who used to seem so distinct and mysterious and like unknowable are now on Twitter, like sharing their whole lives and, and like millions of people follow them and, and hear them. I mean, we've all wondered, you know, that our president even had a Twitter, let alone the fact that he would tweet all day long, you know, and that, that was weird to us, but that's like the new reality. I follow several like professional athletes that I've always kind of admired. And then I follow them on like Twitter. I'm like, God, I would hate this person in real life. What a dork. Like, and you know, and like it kind of ruins it a little bit, but we live in a weird time where not only um, can almost anyone become famous and influential, but those who do reach that level seem more normal um, now than they did just a couple decades ago. I remember during the pandemic, while we're trying to figure out how to live stream, some of the most famous people on the planet were doing like a live stream 
you know, concerts and stuff on YouTube. And I was like, it's so bizarre that we're all sharing the same platform for the first time ever. You know, like they're trying to figure out how to live stream a concert for people and we're trying to figure out how to live stream church. And it was, it was kind of a weird equalizer. But uh, despite all these changes, I think most of us still have that like person or people for whom we would you know, like stand in line or go out of our way to talk to or get an autograph from. You know, like I remember we went to a concert one time and a friend of mine wanted to wait in line to get an autograph. And uh, I think it was David Crowder. And I, and like, I could not understand that. I was like, it's a dude. Like, he's a great singer, love his music. Why would I want him to sign something? Like, I didn't get it. And it spawned this conversation about, like, who would you wait in line? Most of mine are dead, and they're either, like, great thinkers or, or, uh, or uh, authors or something. But, like, if somebody was like, you can go back and talk to C.S. Lewis, I'd probably just start crying. Like, just, like, I can't wait. I'd be like one of those girls screaming in a stadium. Like, he'd walk in the room, and I'd be like, oh, my God, that was C.S. Lewis. You know, that'd probably be me. But, um, but today we're talking about something that is truly unique to the kingdom of God, as we've been kind of walking through some of the things that are that every kingdom's ever had, um, the kingdom of God included. This week we're talking about something that exists um, different in the kingdom of God compared to every other kingdom that's ever existed. So far, we've uh, in this summer series we've focused on universal elements of every kingdom, you know, on the planet. Uh, but we're going to go a different direction this morning. This morning we're looking at. Um, something that's truly unique, and that is the idea of access. What does it mean to have access to our king? We obviously all live in a democracy, a form of government that's supposed to be uh, of the people, for the people, and by the people. In other words, the the form of government that gives people access to leadership, and yet despite our governmental structure and the myriad of ways to communicate today, most of us feel more dislocated uh, and feel like we have less access to the, the realms of power than we ever have before. In fact, lately, um, we've had several things in our family that are kind of weird. Grace is trying to go on a trip to Europe with um, Esther's sister and found out that her birth certificate is messed up. And so she can't get a passport because we don't have the right kind of birth certificate or something. And so we've been trying to call just somebody in Topeka, like, hey, how do we fix this? And can't get anybody on the phone. Like, we can't get anybody to talk to. We're, you know, you bounce through a million automated things to get to nowhere and you're like how can I not have any access to somebody who can tell me what I need here Josiah um, had a mix up on his taxes a couple years ago and we've spent hours on the phone trying to get somebody to go how do we fix this like what do we do here and can't get anybody we've and and this has happened over and over again Esther uh, my other or my daughter got in a wreck and we've just been trying to get a hold of somebody to tell us what's next you can't get anybody on the phone like the the idea of having access to people as much opportunity as we have to communicate now access is going down i think most americans feel that we have no voice in shaping changing or helping our country at all and it's disheartening uh and uh, i mean you can't even get a human on the phone to talk to let alone feel like you have a real impact so uh not only have most christians throughout history felt like separated and maybe even in opposition to their governing authority. Remember, democracy is only about 200 years old. Most Christians have lived under other forms of government, monarchies and and empires and fascism. And the church has survived under almost every form of government. Democracy is a fairly new form. But um, so not only have all those other Christians felt separate and distinct from and uh, maybe even in opposition to their governments, but even those of us now living in democracy are suffering kind of the same thing where we're feeling like we don't have a voice. And, and God's kingdom is different, or at least it's supposed to be different, uh, because it is unique in that, according to the New Testament, the new covenant, um, we are supposed to have access. And in order to kind of capture how unique this is, we're going to look at how different it is in the Old Testament. So I'm going to be reading in Exodus 19. We're actually going to cover quite a bit of scripture today, so I'm going to try to be quick with this. But um, Exodus 19, uh, you can follow, if you want to follow along in your own Bible or app, uh, you can, or the words will be on the screen. But I want to set this up just a little bit. This is right after God has delivered his people from bondage. We spent quite a bit of time in that particular piece of the story in this series. But um, he's now at Mount Sinai getting ready to kind of inaugurate his earthly kingdom at least in the, in the form of a real national context. Um, 
And it was, so this is early Jewish nation. This is kind of the beginning of the Jewish nation. Um, and, uh, and the first time they had a chance to kind of apply the Mosaic law. So this is the beginning of the Mosaic law that shaped Israel as a people, as a nation. So God is giving his law to his people. Um, and it's one of the purest looks at what God intended for his kingdom. And, and, uh, but this morning's passage, it's interesting to look at not just the law of God that he's giving, but the very structure of God's governmental system and how it was altered really before it even had an opportunity to start. We're going to talk about this really key moment that's super easy to kind of overlook. And it's, it's only a couple verses and it's really monumental. Uh, but I think it's essential for us to catch this moment in order to understand how much Jesus and especially the coming of the Holy Spirit has changed things um, in, in a way that's really unprecedented. Um, but this has always been the heart of God for his kingdom. Um, so God's preparing to give his law to his people. He's gathered them around Mount Sinai. They're all kind of gathered around a scene we're kind of familiar with in this series. We talked about this. This is actually the very first Pentecost, the very first time God kind of shows up in person. And it reads like this. Then the Lord told Moses, go down and prepare the people for my arrival. Consecrate them today, tomorrow. Have them wash their clothing. Uh, be sure they are ready on the third day. Uh, for on that day, the Lord will come down on his mountain and all the people, as all the people watch, mark off the boundaries all around the mountain, warn the people, be careful, you do not go up the mountain or even touch its boundaries. Anyone who touches the mountain will certainly be put to death. No hand may touch the person or animals. Uh, no hand may touch the person or animals that crosses the boundary. Instead, stone them. Um, or shoot them with arrows, they must be put to death. So you are, until he says so, you cannot cross the barriers. Um, however, when the ram's horn sounds a long blast, then the people may go up the mountain. So no, no uh, starting ahead of the horn. When the horn blows, then you can all go. So this is God giving Moses instructions on how the people are going to officially meet God. Uh, and this is kind of a huge moment because up to this point, everything that God has done has been through Moses. So the people hadn't really heard from God personally yet. One of Moses' original complaints when he was called to deliver his people was he was like, they're not going to believe me. They're not going to believe that you sent me. Like, how, how, who am I going to tell them I talked to? Like, he knew that the people weren't going to actually see God. They were going to hear him speaking for God, uh, which was very different. And when he went and he said, hey, Pharaoh, deliver my people, and Pharaoh actually increased their work, the people didn't get mad at God. They got mad at Moses. They were like, why are you doing this to us? Why are you messing with us? And every single time something went wrong, the people got mad at Moses uh, because God is kind of behind the scenes at this point. And the reason was God spoke through Moses, um, and Moses was the kind of the, the voice or the, the face of the whole thing. So as a deliverer, Moses played middleman between God and the people. But at Sinai, that was supposed to change. God said, okay, here's what's going to happen from now on. You know, wait till the right moment when I do we'll blow a horn. All the people can come up and meet me. They will no longer have to talk to God through Moses. They will now have access to God for themselves. They'll no longer slaves. They'll be moral free agents um, able to go up the mountain for themselves. And up to this point, they were... The children of Abraham, sure, but they weren't necessarily um, God's people. In fact, there was kind of a, even, even being a child of Abraham, there's a, there's a moment in both Isaac and Jacob's lives, but Jacob's the one that had the clearest where he was like, he had run from his brother, he's, he's out on the street sleeping on a rock, and he's like, God, if you will get me out of this and bring me home safely, I will, you will be my God, and, and I will serve you forever. So even though he was a child of Abraham, a grandson of Abraham, he still had to choose God for himself. Like, there was a moment at which he said, I, you're going to be my God, I'm going to pick you. And so, it's no different for the children of Israel. Just because they're the children of Abraham doesn't mean they've each kind of individually accepted God as their God. Just Moses had made a promise to Abraham to free his descendants. He came and, and did it. And this is the moment at Sinai where they're kind of making a covenant. Do you want to be my people? They said yes. God said, okay, come on up the mountain. When I blow the horn, come up the mountain. So, uh, uh, so here we're at Mount Sinai. God decides that he'll stop dealing with people through this intermediary, Moses, um, and instead, he'll reveal his glory to all his people. So in the passage we just read, God tells 
Um, Moses had to prepare the people for his presence. He said, take a couple days, get them ready. Um, actually, almost three days. And there's a little bit of a bunny trail, but I do want to um, ask, like, what do we do to prepare for God's presence? Um, and this is, a, this is kind of a, a question. I'm, I might get a little bit preachy here, but I want us to think about, um, do we prepare before coming to church on Sundays? Like some people dress up on Sundays. Some people dress nicer on Sundays than any, than, than any other day. And, and it isn't because of a legalism or, or like an old-fashioned understanding of respect or, respect or tradition. It's just one of the ways they set apart this day as special. And they say, this is a different kind of day, and I want to make it. They consecrate themselves in a way to get ready for Sunday mornings. That's what the people did in this story. God said, hey, this is going to be different. You're going to, you're going to be in my presence, and you need to prepare for it. And I'm obviously not a formal guy like at all, and I don't want our atmosphere to ever feel formal. But there's a huge difference between formal and reverent. right? We do want our presence to be reverent, where we know we're going into the presence of God. There's a there's a reverence to recognizing that when we get together in the presence of God, uh, it's different. It prompted Jesus to go, hey, when you gather, two or three of you gather in my name, I'm going to be there. It's going to be different when you gather. Um, and, and if there's any proof that this is different to me, if there's any proof that gathering together is actually different, it's the way that all hell breaks loose on Sunday mornings. I don't know if anybody else has ever experienced this, but like you can get your kids up to do almost anything and then you have to do it for church and it is like every demon in hell is fighting against you. Like, uh, you know, if I had a dollar for every time some of our tech broke on Sunday morning, it works great until we get into church on Sunday morning and Brett's like, nothing will turn on. And I'm like, how can it work every day of the week except Sunday morning, right? If I had a quarter for every Sunday morning that an argument or a hurt feeling like starts on a Sunday morning, getting ready for church. You know, when you're like, we're going to be late again. Well, if you would get out of bed, God bless you, brother. You know, when you walk in the door, you know, that's, that's what we all do. Like it's like every, anyone else ever notice how easy it is to come up with an excuse to skip church? Like so easy. Like there's a million, and not even just excuses. They're all like legit. Like they're real. And I think, I think, it's a sign how ridiculously, you know, disproportionately difficult it is to get here. Like it is, it is hard to get here. And I think it's, it's. Uh, I think the reason a thousand things pop up on sixty mornings, Sunday mornings, to keep us from gathering together is because there's something really important about gathering together. There's something really important. I genuinely believe there's something different when we gather in Jesus' names. And if if this story is any indication of our own lives, the way these people like had to consecrate themselves. They had to, like, they had to prepare ahead of time for God's presence. In this morning's story, God told Moses to spend three days getting ready for the presence. And I can tell you, if we don't do the same, if we don't like decide ahead of time church is going to be important, 20 million things will pop up to keep us from getting here. If we don't think ahead and go, you know what? No matter what gets in my way, I'm going to get into God's presence this week. If we don't do that, we never will. If the Israelites didn't just go to God's presence, they prepared for it. They set this time aside to uh, and and I'll tell you, you know, one of the things, and this is this is really weird considering the weird OFAM swap we have going on this morning. But you know, we have some people that that are on in the OFAM every single week, and I love that they're there and there's no other way they can join and that's beautiful. We have people that now join when they travel and that's beautiful and I love it. But I also know there's plenty of people that join because it's easy. And and I just I want you to know if you're out there in the OFAM or wherever you are, we miss you. And it's it's better when you're here. And something's different when you're here. And and we could really stand to have you here. And so, you know, if you're if you're one of our people that it's you just can't get here feel zero guilt about that. Like we love that you're joining online and that's beautiful. But otherwise, if you can be here, be here. Like we, we need you here. There's something different when we gather together and you have to prepare for that. So that's my preachiness for today. I'm done. Um, so in this morning's passage, the people of Israel, recognizing that this is a really big deal, spent three days in holy preparation for God's presence. And when the time came, this is what happened. On the third, or on the morning of the third day, thunder roared and lightning flashed and a dense cloud came down the mountain and there was a long, loud blast of a ram's horn and all the people trembled. 
Moses led them out from the camp to meet with God. And they stood at the foot of the mountain. All of Mount Sinai was covered with smoke because the Lord had descended in the form of a fire. The smoke billowed into the sky like smoke from a brick kiln. And the whole mountain shook violently. As the blast of the ram's horn grew louder and louder, Moses spoke and God thundered his reply. The Lord came down the top of Mount Sinai and called Moses to the top of the mountain. So Moses climbed to the mountain. Now, before we really unpack this, um, remember what God had said three days before this, uh, that the people, when the ram's horn blast, the people may go up the mountain. So the horn has blown. Um, So here we are. Three days later, the presence of God has come down in this kind of miraculously dramatic way. The horn sounds which is supposed to invite the people to cross this barrier that you weren't allowed to cross early um, and come up the mountain. Moses calls all the people, leads them out of the camp to the foot of the mountain, um, and there's this kind of frozen moment where the presence of God is physically and recognizably on the mountain. And all those people are at the foot of the mountain, ready to go up and meet with God. And and the idea of Moses speaking for God uh, is about to end. So now the people will have their own direct access To God, Because up to this point, Moses could have just as easily been a magician or some Egyptian sorcerer. They don't know. All they know is that when Moses shows up, miracles happen. So they don't really know much about God himself. They just know Moses can do amazing things. He could have just as easily been a powerful sorcerer. But now here's God, ready to talk to the people directly without Moses as a middleman. Um, And God starts the proceedings by calling Moses in a way that everyone could hear God call Moses. Um, So they knew that God was not making this stuff up, which actually was part of God's plan. Just before this happened, like three days before, God says this, Then the Lord said to Moses, I will come to you in a thick cloud, Moses, so the people themselves can hear me when I speak to you. Then they will always trust you. Because up till then, I think God was just kind of speaking in Moses' ear, you know, doing the, hey, thus says the Lord. And I'm sure there were some people that were like, yeah, you're making that up. Because it's always... (laughs) <laughs> let's pretend for a second that somebody shows up like, hey, God told me you're supposed to tithe. You're supposed to give me a tenth. And and you're also supposed to give me like a grain offering. And that's kind of boring. So throw a wine offering in with it. Like there had to be people that were like, dude, you're just trying to get me to give you a meal. Like, come on. Like you just want me to feed you. I had to be s- some skeptical people. And so God is like, I'm going to talk to you in a way that everyone will hear it. And then they'll know that I'm the one who's been talking to you. So God was planning this all along. So up to this point, God spoke to Moses, but no one else. And now he's going to prove that he's been talking to God. Moses goes up the mountain, speaks with God. And when he comes back down to apparently invite everybody up the mountain, here's what happens. When the people heard the thunder and the loud blast of the ram's horn, and when they saw the flashes of lightning and the smoke billowing from the mountain, they stood at a distance and trembled with fear. And they said to Moses, you speak to us. And we will listen, but do not let God speak directly to us or we will die. And in that moment, God, so God, let's wrap this up. God delivers his people from Egypt. They walk to Sinai where God, through the words of Moses, invites them into this covenant. And, you know, if you will keep my commands, um, uh, you will be my people. And they, of their own free will, say, we want to be your people. You'll be our God. Um, Having made that covenant, God invites them up the mountain to meet him directly um, as his covenant people with no intermediary face to face for the very first time. God commands to take some time to prepare themselves for this meeting. Three days later, they gather ready to meet God himself for the very first time. Moses gets called up the mountain. He goes and when he returns, the people completely chicken out. They're like, you know what? We kind of dig this in between thing. Like that is terrifying and and we got to be super careful not to judge even in you know because even in the days of like great we live in a days with great special effects if you've ever been to disney like the stuff they can pull off you know you walk into a little room they buckle you in like you're in a starship and then they fly you around and because there's screens everywhere you like feel like you're moving like you know they you take off and it like pins you to the back of your seat i don't know how they do it i don't know if they just tip you and do this but because the screens, like everything moves past you, you totally feel like you're moving. Like we live in a day where we can do amazing things with special effects. And even then, I don't think I'd go up that mountain. Like that had to be terrifying. You know, a whole mountain that's on fire, engulfed in smoke and flames and earthquakes and lightning. I mean, this is an intimidating scene and the people make a fairly logical call here. They're like, hey, you did, you're doing great. We love the fact that you've been running things. 
let's not mess it up. Let's just, you go up the mountain and, and we'll stay here and you just tell us what to do. But the thing I think we often miss is how simple the statement, uh, you speak to us and we will listen, but do not let God speak directly to us or we die. The entire n- nature of Israel's relationship with God changed in that moment. God was inviting them up the mountain to know him personally. He was offering them access. But the people decided instead to opt for what basically developed into a Levitical priesthood, where someone will always stand between us and God. And we will go to the priest and we'll make our sacrifices and the the priest and the prophet will speak to us, but they, they forfeited access to God. And from this moment on, God always uses a go-between to speak to his people in Israel. And a lot of times, you know, we have a tendency to draw to the, the heroes of the scripture. You know, we read their story and, and you know, there's maybe 20 of them and millions of Jews. And maybe we, we always act like we would be one of the 20, you know, like I, I want to be just like Elijah. I want to be just like, you know, but chances are we would have been one of the millions, you know, of, of people. The reason their story made it into the Bible was because it was unique because it was weird, you know, that, that Elijah did the things he did. A lot of those aren't there because that's the way every believer in Jesus is supposed to experience those kind of things. That story was told because it was a weird story and it stood out. And that's the stories we always tell. We rarely tell the ordinary every day. You know, I got up, worshiped God, went about my day, did my business, you know, went to bed, put my kids to bed, praised God again. You know, they don't tell those stories. They tell the weird stories. But, uh, but because of this moment at Mount Sinai where they, they basically decide they do not want direct access to God, everything changes until Jesus. When Jesus comes, he shows up under the name Emmanuel, God with us. And, and, and the, the scene in Exodus is why that name is such a big deal, why we, we make a big deal about it every Christmas and we talk about Emmanuel every Christmas. Um, because from that morning on Mount Sinai... Uh, it was always supposed to be God with us. That's what God was inviting them to. He was inviting them up the mountain for this Emmanuel moment. God's people with God. No longer speaking through a priest or a prophet. So when Jesus shows up, that all changes. Jesus becomes the God we can see face to face. He becomes Emmanuel, the God with us. This, this invitation of intimacies. And at his last meal... With his, with his followers before his death, Jesus quotes this Old Testament passage that we've already talked about in this series where he says, the day is coming, says the Lord, when I'll make a new covenant with the people of Israel and Judah. The covenant will not be like the one I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand and brought them out of the land of Egypt. That's talking about what we're talking about this morning. They broke that covenant, though I love them as a, as a husband loves his wife, says the Lord. But this is the new covenant I'll make with the people of Israel in those days, says the Lord, I will put my instructions deep within them. I'll write them on their hearts. I will be their God. They'll be my people. There'll be no need for uh, to teach their neighbors nor uh, to say to their relatives saying, you should know the Lord. For everyone from the least to the greatest will, will know me already, says the Lord. And I will forgive their wickedness and I will never remember their sins again. This passage kind of sits in Jeremiah as this like beautiful bridge between the first covenant between God and his people at the foot of Mount Sinai and this new covenant made between God and his son on the cross. The first covenant was God's word given on tablets of stone. The second was God burying his word in the person's heart in the form of the Holy Spirit. But maybe the most significant difference between these two covenants that's bridged by this one verse in Jeremiah, because there's nothing else in the Old Testament talking about a new covenant. So when Jesus says, hey, we're going to make a new covenant, he's obviously talking about this verse. And, but the, the, the biggest is, is, whereas the covenant at Sinai hits this moment where the people choose a priestly system over like a personal engagement with God. This new covenant is necessarily marked by intimacy. By this, I'm going to go on the inside. This is going to be different. I will put my instructions deep within them. I'll write them on their hearts and I will be their God. They'll be my people. The writer of the book of Hebrews actually preaches this exact sermon in chapter 12. He says, we have not come to a physical mountain, a place of flaming fire, darkness, gloom, and whirlwind as the Israelites did at Mount Sinai. For they heard an awesome trumpet blast and a voice so terrible that they begged God to stop speaking. They staggered back under God's command. Even if an animal touches the mountain, it must be stoned to death. 
Moses himself was so frightened at the sight that he said, I'm terrified and trembling. No, you have come to Mount Zion, the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and the countless, thou- where, uh, and the countless thousands of angels uh, in joy- joyful gathering. You have come to the assembly of God's firstborn children, whose names are written in heaven. You have come to God himself, who is the judge over all things. You've come to the spirits of the righteous ones in heaven uh, who have been made perfect. You have come to Jesus, the one who mediates the new covenant between God and his people, and to the sprinkled blood which speaks of forgiveness instead of crying out for vengeance like the blood of Abel. Since we received a kingdom that is unshakable, let us be thankful and please God by worshiping him with holy fear and awe. So the writer of Hebrews speaking to you and to me says we don't gather under that scary mountain, that terrifying mountain mediated by Moses. We go to God himself. And, and we have come to Jesus himself. So, so one of the most distinctive elements of the, the new kingdom, this unshakable kingdom, is that we have real and intimate access to the king. And this is symbolically and kind of dramatically depicted when Jesus is dying on the cross by the veil that separated the presence of God from the people in the temple being torn from top to bottom. There is now no more separation between us and God's presence. We have full access to God. And that is the theology of it. That, that is what happened in the new covenant. One of the most unprecedented and, and unfortunately I feel taken for granted elements of God's kingdom is that we have immediate and unfettered access to God's presence. And before we talk about what that means or should mean to us, I do want to talk about two things in the early church that kind of show how huge of an impact this is. And this is just stuff that kind of impresses me. But, you know, in Acts 15, we've talked about this a lot, um, uh, but the early church had some fairly intense conflicts uh, and the apostles and elders met to discuss how to proceed with the, you know, with all this. And they unpack what's going on. And I don't want to unpack it all because we've already done it in this series. But you've got two church groups. One that believes you can't really be saved unless you do this. And one that, you know, believes that's not true. And, and there's they're, a pretty bitter conflict. And when they send out a letter to kind of fix the problem, it starts this way. For it seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us to lay no greater burdens on you than these few things. This group of Jesus followers effectively made adjustments to the way church was functioning that would literally change the course of church forever. Like everything we know of, the reason we celebrate Christmas instead of Hanukkah, the reason we celebrate Easter instead of Passover was because of what happened in Acts 15. He said, officially, there's no reason for the Gentile church to turn Jewish. Go see what a Gentile church looks like. Go make it. And, and, and you have the freedom to, to explore what it looks like to worship Jesus in your context. This is a problem I think the colonial missions era had. We would go to Africa as, as kind of American missionaries or English missionaries, and we'd walk in, nobody has a shirt on. We're like, if you want to worship Jesus, first thing you got to put a shirt on, because it's not okay to, to worship Jesus. You also have to dress like us, act like us, be like us. And we were doing exactly what the Jewish church was doing here. The Jewish church was going, it's okay to, to worship Jesus, but come on, you got to act Jewish. You got to do what we do. You got to eat how we eat. You got to dress how we dress. You got to do what we do. And, and we've all picked that up. We have this tendency to go, hey, if you're going to be a Christian, you kind of got to do it the way we do it. That wasn't even in my notes. I don't know why I dove into that. But, um, but when we read, you know, Acts 15 and, and the, the major changes they made to the church, we're comfortable with it because it's in the Bible, right? Like, we're like, hey, the, of course the apostles did that. That's what they were supposed to do. Like, you know, they, they made changes to the church. But 300 years later, you got a group of people who decided what would be in the Bible. They debated and they, they looked at all the letters they had and, and they said the same thing. Because of what we feel the Holy Spirit telling us, this is what we believe. And they used good human wisdom. They, they, when you look at the way that they chose, what they were mostly doing was ratifying what the church for about 300 years had already decided was the books. But they somehow felt they had the authority to go, this is what is. That's because they trusted and believed that the Holy Spirit was what he was supposed to be. 
which is this true and honest access to God to do things and make big decisions. These are real humans taking their access to God incredibly seriously. And what I really want to kind of wrestle with today is do we do that? Do we take our access to God that seriously? Do we honestly believe that God can lead us and speak to us and direct us by His Holy Spirit? Do we believe that the Holy Spirit dwells in us and that that's not a metaphor? That's, it's, it's a reality that is supposed to affect the way we function and the way we make decisions and the way we live our lives. In other words, do we live our lives as though we have access to the heart and mind of God as close as though it's written inside you? I mean, how many of us, if we uh, had a direct line to the Oval Office, would not wear that thing out? Like how many of us, if, if you just could just pick up your phone and call the president, how many of us wouldn't go, what are you thinking? Like, seriously, dude. Or, or hey, I got some suggestions. I think if we tried that, like, who wouldn't use that phone number, right? Or, dude, great day today. Hey, you, you killed it. Like, whatever. I think if we had access to real things in our world, we would probably use it. Most of us would, would make that call. Most of us are frustrated we don't have access. Most of us are frustrated there's nobody we can call, nobody we can talk to, to, to help fix things. If we had that kind of access, I think we'd use it. The crazy thing is, I feel like we do have that kind of access in the kingdom of God. Last week we talked about Jesus telling us not to cast our pearl before swine, but rather that we should ask and seek and knock and bring our desires to Him and not quit doing it. Keep doing it. Keep asking. Keep seeking. Keep knocking. In other words, Jesus was telling us to take advantage of our access. The writer of Hebrews says it this way, Let us come boldly to the throne of our gracious God. There we will receive mercy and we will find grace to help us in times of need. So I think the church needs to start expecting God to speak to us. We need to start expecting God to speak to our children. I mentioned last week that SI I've been working hard to kind of take Mary's advice from John 2 and just start saying, do whatever Jesus tells you. When Jesus turned water to wine, you know, she didn't even ask how it was going to happen, what was going to happen. She just said, hey, do whatever he tells you. She just pointed everybody to Jesus. Do what he tells you. We've been trying to do that more because we so desperately want to control their behavior and go, here's what God wants you to do. We're, we've been trying to get better at going, hey, do what Jesus tells you to do. And, and part of that is, is like Samuel. Samuel was hearing God's voice. He didn't know it was God's voice. And Eli had to go, hey, that's God talking to you. You should go answer him. So part of it is learning, helping them learn to, to recognize God's voice. But, but I think we need to start expecting God to speak to our children. Oops, where am I going? And, and when I was studying this morning's passage, I, I wondered if maybe a bunch of adults don't need that too. Just like we need an Eli to go, here's what it sounds like when God speaks to you. Hey, that's God speaking to you. You should probably go listen to that. I know our kids need that. Maybe we need that. Maybe we need to start asking God to help us recognize His voice because if we're just following a list of rules and we're just reading our Bibles and going to church and so on and doing the things, then how are we any different than the Old Testament believers? How are we any different? If all we're doing is, 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 is going through the rituals and, and doing the things like they did, then what makes the new covenant new? if we don't have a different kind of access. I mean, yes, we're saved by grace and not by works, and we get to go to heaven when we die because of the work of Jesus, and that's amazing. I don't want to downplay that. That's a, that is a great difference between the new covenant and the old covenant. Kind of a big deal. Um, I don't want to play that down, but in terms of everyday life in the kingdom of God, right here, right now, if we don't recognize that the Spirit of God is actually dwelling in us, and we have direct access to God that affords us a different kind of living, then, then we aren't living a new covenant life. We're just living the Old Testament life. I think we need to start taking seriously the fact that the Holy Spirit dwells in us and is supposed to make things different. I think we need to recognize that we are never alone and that that voice of... The, uh, and that's not a kind of vague recognition of God's omnipresence. God's everywhere. We're never alone. You know, blah, blah, blah. No, it's not like that. We are never alone. We have immediate access to our comforter every single day. We also need to recognize the Holy Spirit goes where we go, watches what we watch, reads what we read, listens to what we listen to. We talked a few weeks ago about the, the differing convictions and liberties. You know, in Paul's day, the big topic was meat offered up to idols. You know, there was people who would, in the marketplace, 
make a perfunctory, I offer this meat up to Zeus or whatever, and then they would sell it, you know, and people who worship Zeus would tend to buy the meat that was offered up to Zeus, and it was all, you know, and the Christians were struggling with it. Some of them were like, well, I can't eat something that's been offered up to Zeus, you know, so they wouldn't buy it. And other Christians were like, that's a chunk of wood or stone or whatever. The whole thing's made up anyway. It's meat. I'm going to eat it. Like there was other people who was like, this is silly. Like, and, but those people were arguing with each other. They, like they were, he's a sinner. How can you do that? That was, that was part of pagan worship. The other people were like, it's cow. That's, a, that's wood. I, I'm going to eat it. You know? And, and it, it got kind of a big deal. And Paul was like, hey, the thing is, if, if when you say no to that meat, you feel closer to God for it, then that's the right thing to do. And if you eat it, you can thank God for it, then that's the right thing to do. Like, and the main thing is leave each other alone. Don't judge or stumble each other. It's okay. The problem often comes in when we don't really know how we truly feel about something. Sometimes we're like, I can't tell if I really have a liberty to do this or if I just really want to do it. And so I'm saying I have a liberty, you know. And I've always told people that, you know, imagine the presence of the Holy Spirit real and tangible next to you. Are you comfortable doing that with the Holy Spirit? Are you comfortable doing that? If so, do it. Knock yourself out. Have a good time. If there's part of you that like feels like you're hiding a little bit, like then yeah, you're probably not supposed to do it. If you can't do it in the full presence of God and know that, that this is part of you know uh, your worship and you're grateful to God for it, if you can't do that, you probably shouldn't do it. That probably means you don't have a liberty to do it. And honestly, I, I think awareness of the presence of the Holy Spirit in our life goes a long way to sorting out a, an awful lot of our issues. I think it's something we need to begin to expect and if we don't recognize the Holy Spirit in our lives, we need to start to badger heaven until we do. We need to really start like pounding on heaven's doors. In fact, we talked about asking and seeking and knocking from the Gospel of Matthew last week. But here's the way Luke tells that same story. He says, so I tell you, keep on asking. Uh, you will receive what you ask for. Keep on seeking and you'll find. Keep on knocking and the door will be open to you. For everyone who asks, receives. Everyone who seeks, finds. Everyone who knocks, the door will be open. You, f- you fathers, if your children ask for a fish, would you give them a snake instead? If he asked for an egg, would you give him a scorpion? Of course not. And if you pe- sinful people know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? So when Luke is talking about you know, bringing our prayers and our needs and our desires to God, he describes it in the context of God giving the Holy Spirit to us. Almost to say the Holy Spirit living in you is the answer to those prayers. If you need healing, yeah, that comes through the Holy Spirit. 1 Corinthians 12. Do you need wisdom? Holy Spirit. Do you need patience? Yeah, that's a fruit of the Spirit. Whatever you're praying for, the answer is probably... In the Holy Spirit, ask, seek, knock, and God will answer by giving you the Holy Spirit. I think we need to begin to to do just that, to expect God to be good and to not give us a snake or a scorpion, but to give us the Holy Spirit when we ask. So how do we respond to this? My second son, Matthew, um, who plays drums for us quite a bit, is a doctoral student at KU. He's way smarter than me, which I'm not at all happy about. Um, it wasn't supposed to work out that way. I, I tend to talk to God this, about it the second I get to heaven. But um, a couple years ago, I was bidding this job um, for a lady who works at KU in the engineering department. I didn't know that when I was bidding the job. I found this out when I was bidding it. And uh, when I found out where she worked, I mentioned that Matthew was, was at KU and her eyes lit up. She was like, Matthew Heinzelman. That's what I thought. She was like, I wondered if you guys were related when I heard your name. Um, I know Matthew. We all know Matthew. And there's like 28,000 kids at KU and two or 3,000 in the engineering department. And so the fact that everyone knows Matthew made no sense to me at all. And so I asked her about it. And she was like, she works in the engineering offices, like just in the corporate, like the whatever, the administrative office of the engineering department. And she goes, we wish every student was like Matthew. Um, because Matthew has no trouble walking in and asking for help. She said, uh, it, and it didn't matter if it was help figuring out which classes to take next or financial aid or work opportunities or just wanting to know which teachers were best at teaching which subjects. She's like, Matthew comes in every day and just like, hey, I need help and just ask for help. He has no trouble asking for advice. She said, you don't know how frustrating it is to sit on top of all of these resources that could really help students and 99% of them will never walk in and ask for help. She's like, we have money, we have, we have scholarships, we have, you know, 
books that explain things. Like we have so many resources to help students. And most of them are either out drinking and going to parties or they're too arrogant and cocky to feel like they need help so they don't walk in. She's like, so we mostly sit on top of this pile of riches and nobody comes in to get any. Like, and so when someone like Matthew walks in and they're like, hey, I need help. And you're like, oh man, I have so many things for you. Like, she's like, we love it. We love it when kids will walk in and ask for help. And I wonder if the Holy Spirit feels that way about us. I wonder if we have access to tons of resources that we never take advantage of because we simply don't ask, seek, and knock. And like we pray for our needs. Like we, you know, God, I need this guy, you know. But do we go, hey, I need to know you are here. I'm dealing with some serious anxiety. I'm dealing with this. I'm dealing with that. And, and you promised me presence. You promised me access, that this was supposed to be different. I wonder, I wonder if the Holy Spirit's like, I'm right here. But, there's, and there's always a but, there's a vulnerability to this. Matthew had to walk in and ask for help. And according to the lady, most kids won't do that. They won't ask for help. They, they, they pretend they're all good. They don't need help. They got this. And there's definitely a vulnerability to living aware of the Holy Spirit's presence. I mentioned a minute, uh, mentioned a minute ago that if we live aware of the presence of God, it makes sin and selfishness and unforgiveness and bitterness and hate really hard. Because it's really tough to, to embrace those things the way we want to when we're trying to live aware of the Spirit's presence in our life. There's a cost to living aware of the Holy Spirit's presence. And that cost is conviction. And I, I'm, I'm not even saying the Holy Spirit's going to pick on you. You know, don't do that, don't do that. I'm not even saying that. I'm just saying the, the Holy Spirit, I think the Holy Spirit actually empowers us to do better and to love better. But I think the, the conviction simply comes from the awareness that we're sinning right with the Holy Spirit. Paul went so far, he was, he was talking about sexual immorality one time. He's like, don't you know your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit? That when you do that, I mean, he was talking about prostitution because he's talking to a pagan uh, church and, and prostitution was part of their worship, you know, in their old religion. And so some of them were carrying it on. And he was like, don't you know that you're the temple of the Holy Spirit? When you join your body to a prostitute, you're joining the Holy Spirit to a prostitute? Like it's... He does it like it's a duh, you know, the way he kind of says it. He's like, when you sin, you take the Holy Spirit with you. There's a vulnerability and a humility to knowing that, that if the Spirit's presence is active in your life, it goes everywhere with you. But I think we'd be crazy to not take this morning's passages seriously. I mean, I've read a lot of scripture today that to me basically makes it clear that direct and tangible access to God through the person of the Holy Spirit is supposed to be a key distinction of the New Testament, the New Covenant. It's supposed to be what's different. But many believers will quote all day long a hundred do's and don'ts and we'll expect everybody around us to, to live according to those. Ah, you shouldn't do this, you shouldn't do this. You should, uh, uh, uh. And, and, and we want them to take it seriously because it's in the Bible. We're quoting Scripture. But we'll come up with a thousand excuses why we no longer experience the Holy Spirit the way they used to. And I call that BS. Bologna sandwich. <laughs> I think it's time that we expect the Bible to be true. We expect the Holy Spirit to be real and present. God with us. God with our kids. God with our churches. So the way that I love, would love to respond to this message is I think pretty self-evident. We need to start praying that the Holy Spirit become active in our lives in such a way that we know we're not alone. That we know we actually have access to real power to see real change in our lives, real change in our families and in our kids. And I'll be honest, praying that the Holy Spirit, I, I've been praying that the Holy Spirit would start to fall on us and, and shake things up. And I invite you to pray that with me.